Thanks for tuning in to Temp Talks 2020 online edition. Uh, in the comfort of your own home, I'm Victor Leung. Uh, some of my common titles are doctor, uh, bear fighter, uh, but most importantly, I'll be your hostess with the mostest uh, for our online version of Temp Talks 2020. Uh, joining you live from the cupola of the International Space Station. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I'll be graduating here in a couple days. I'm a five-year veteran of the STEM program, and I'll be heading down to UBC in the fall to study science uh, with an intention to major in uh, computer science. Uh, but that's enough about me. Uh, Time Talks has been an annual STEM tradition, STEM tradition uh, where students get to share their uh, favorite learning experiences uh, in front of a live person audience at uh, Templeton. And at the end of the night, uh, we typically ended off with a cafeteria gallery walk uh, where other STEM students can have more of a personal uh, connection and show off their project again to the audience members. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that was not doable this year, but here we are in our web edition. Uh, I'd like to thank the students uh, that are here with us today and that have uh, uh, contributed uh, to this online version. And I'd also like to thank uh, Hengewald and Janzi for wanting to uh, continue this tradition. Um, tonight, we have five uh, main stage presentations lined up for you. Uh, we have three presenters that will join us live and we have two uh, short video presenters that have uh, pre-recorded a video presentation. Uh, house specials of tonight are up first. We have a live presentation from Sam and Elliot. Uh, they'll be discussing their pathfinding slam robot, uh, but also they'll be talking a little bit about uh, technological advances and hopefully they'll show the bond uh, that they've created uh, through their project work. Uh, following that, we have a short video presentation uh, from Mercedes and Isabel, uh, two girls in STEM 9 who will be talking about uh, their passions and successes that they found uh, in math and how they've developed uh, critical thinking as a tool and how it's applicable to broader topics. Following that, we have uh, another live presentation from Ambu, a girl in STEM 10. She'll be talking about uh, sort of STEM 10's uh, green theme uh, for projects this year, uh, but also she'll be talking about uh, the interdisciplinary nature of the STEM fields and how the borders between the topics are typically uh, crossed. Uh, following that, we have another video presentation uh, from Max in STEM 10. Uh, he'll be talking about his capstone submarine and um, how it's possible to master core competencies uh, through his self-directed learning. And last, uh, but definitely not least, uh, we have a live presentation from uh, Tyler. He's also in STEM 12. Uh, he'll be talking about his SAP internship, uh, how he's learned modern day skills in the STEM program. And now he's translated that into that uh, internship. And now he will translate the, his skills into any future workplaces that he may un end up in. And of course, uh, to end off the evening, we've had students uh, from across the STEM cohorts uh, curate a video about talking about their favorite uh, learning experiences from the year. Uh, we've taken those videos and we've put them all into one large collection, uh, which we'll share you. Uh, we'll share the website with you at the end of the night. I do hope uh, you stay tuned for that. Um, thank you for listening to me. Uh, I'll see you all in a very, very short bit. Uh, but before I go, I'd like to invite a short video uh, from Templeton's principal, Raz Marani, uh, to say a few words and also our program coordinator, uh, Mike Kengeveld, also to say a few words, uh, Mr. Marani. Good evening and welcome to the seventh annual Templeton Temp Talks. Um, my name is Razum Rani. I'm the principal here at Templeton Secondary School. And I'd like to start by acknowledging that we live, work, play, and learn on the traditional unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh Coast Salish peoples. And we're very, very fortunate to be living on this beautiful land. Um, I want to welcome everybody this evening. I really want to apologize for not being there in person, but unfortunately I had a prior commitment. Um, but really want to just take a few moments just to to thank the staff and the students in the um, STEM program for all of their hard work and dedication this year. This has not been an easy year by any means. This year um, started off uh, with a lot of promise and a lot of expectations, but clearly um, that changed uh, as of spring break. And I think that the continuation of learning um, um, has continued, but it's been a, a challenge for not just staff, but for students as well. So the fact that we are able to be here this evening and to and have this culminate in um, a beautiful presentation of um, of the work and dedication that you students have put together, um, despite the obstacles that you face this year, I think is a, a testament. So really, I feel like this seventh annual Temp Talks is probably a, 
a very, very special one because it's under these um, less than ideal circumstances. Um, you know, I also want to want to commend you on your commitment to um, the program in terms of seeing through the the practical application of the um, the content and the information that you are presented in class. You know, it's one of the things that we struggle as an educational system is to make learning relevant. How do we make it relevant? How do we make it something that students understand why they're spending hours and upon hours learning about topics that may or may not be applicable to them when they proceed beyond high school? And the fact that you're able to, within your time here at Templeton, take the knowledge that you've learned and apply it into real world applications, I think is really, really valuable and something that I think we should be doing more of um, as a collective and not just have it isolated to a program like STEM. Um, so we're very fortunate that a program like this exists and that you students are seeing it through and are benefiting from the great work and the great effort that has been put in prior to prior to my arrival and uh, and prior to your involvement in the program. So I really want to wish you well and I want to congratulate you all for the um, outstanding work that you have done and that you will continue to do. Uh, and thank you for having me be a small part of your event this evening. Take care. Thank you uh, for those kind words, Mr. Moretti. Uh, your presence is missed, but uh, I'm glad you could share that video with us. Um, and we'll always press on in the STEM program and we will own our education as students. And now, um, as promised, our program coordinator, uh, Mike Engelwald, he'll be joining us here to say a couple words. Hello, you can hear me, Victor? I can hear you well. Excellent, okay. Um, well, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Engelwald. I'm the uh, program coordinator for um, Templeton STEM. Um, and I have to say just off uh, at the outset, um, I'm upstairs in my house here in East Vancouver. Uh, so this is a little bit unusual, but uh, here we go. Uh, this is easily my favorite part of the year, um, every year. Um, it's a chance where really um, students get a chance to do the talking um, instead of the teachers. Um, so I, I'm sure that to a degree, uh, the students really like that as well. Um, I think one of the other things that's worth recognizing, and I think um, uh, Mr. Morani uh, spoke to that, is that um, while this is a really strange time, it's, it's introducing some interesting elements that I hadn't really thought of before. Like this is uh, the seventh annual, but it's the first time that we've invited people who you know, wouldn't be able to get into the physical building. So for example, um, I know that I have people who are on the Eastern Seaboard and in Toronto who are uh, watching this, uh, which is crazy. I don't know why we didn't do that before. So um, it's not all bad. Anyways, in terms of um, a few moments uh, to speak before we get going, uh, one of the questions that we ask as teachers, because the students really do most of the work, but, but the thing that really drives uh, the program for us is um, asking the simple question, who owns the learning? Um, and uh, the answer has to be the students. Um, and, uh, you know, it, from that standpoint, I don't really feel like that I'm the boss per se. Um, and so what we feel and what we find is that when students are at the center of their learning, that uh, really what you see is um, uh, improved outcomes or amazing outcomes. And, and I really hope that that shines through uh, tonight. Uh, the thing that like when we say who owns learning and how do you put students at the center, there's sort of really three key, key things that happen. Um, the first is that students really need flexibility and, and choice. Um, I think in some senses, flexibility, um, those of you who are parents will have seen that in your, your teens sleeping in. I'm not necessarily saying that that's the kind of flexibility that we need to have <laughs> per se. I don't have any problem with sleeping in, but when we talk about flexibility, um, you know, do we need to meet at the same time and do things have to be a certain way and does everyone need to learn at the same rate? Um, I think that we're asking some serious questions about that. And definitely students thrive when they have choice. Um, authentic goals are really important. If you don't have goals where the student understands and can see how there's value in what they're doing um, and that it's not a made up activity, um, I, find, I find when it's, when people can see why they're doing it, they, they, they tend to, to do well and really buy into the activity. Um, and finally, I think uh, it's really important that people understand that it's a safe learning community. Uh, and by safe, I mean um, the obvious things like, you know, um, body and mind, but, but um, that, that it's okay to make mistakes and that you don't need to know all the answers. And that you can change your mind. Um, and I think when those three things are in place, um, you see students shine and, uh, and it's a lot of fun. Um, and I certainly enjoy it. Um, I would be remiss at this point if I didn't mention, it's not just me. I mean, I'm standing up here wearing the uh, flying the colors, uh, but I'm working with three amazing colleagues that I, I do need to mention and, and may not appear in face, uh, but are behind uh, what we're doing here. So um, Kyle Renwick and, and uh, Ms. Ravinder Kerr uh, are, are working both together with this STEM9 cohort. And um, their leadership and their new ideas and the passion that they bring to the program um, has been amazing. And I think you'll see that um, when Isabel and uh, Mercedes come up and present. 
um, they've been integral to the process and there are four of us in total um, and they're, they're, uh, they, they, they're an amazing addition to our team. Um, the other person who uh, may remain unseen in this presentation, but is a huge piece of what we do, uh, Mr. Carl Janzi, um, I think behind the controls of the Zoom of what we're doing here, um, is our STEM technology uh, person, problem solver extraordinaire, and uh, an inveterate coffee drinker. Uh, I, I, I struggle with the amount of coffee I drink, and Carl is not making it easier. Uh, but together, um, the two of us, uh, he's an educational visionary, and it's a lot of fun to work with him. And together, uh, we, we do what we can to um, bring that students uh, to the center. So uh, a big thanks to uh, the, the four of them, uh, to, the, to the three of them. And uh, I think at this point, it's over to you, Victor. I'm all done. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hengervold, for those words. Um, we are always forever gracious of your presence. And I'm happy that you're here to uh, guide us and help us as students. Uh, but onwards with the show, uh, let's move into tonight's specials. Uh, up first, very first, our first live presenters joining us live uh, for first uh, ever Temp Talks Online 2020 web edition. I've heard of fraternal twins. I've heard of uh, biological twins. Uh, but rarely have I heard of a more uh, complimentary duo uh, than the Wonder Twins. Uh, Sam and Elliot, uh, who are here with us tonight, uh, who will happily share their slam bot with you. Over to you guys. How's it going, everybody? I hope you're all doing well. Today, we're going to be talking about our project, Slambot, the future of innovation. So let's get into it. So in recent years, humans have progressed artificial intelligence and technology to a point where many tasks and jobs have been filled by machines. But how can two high school students take advantage of this technology? We want to know how we can engage with the field of automation and build our own autonomous project using the components and resources available to us. And how could we apply what we've learned from this project in the real world? Uh, so I'm Elliot. I'm a grade 12 STEM student graduating this year, and I'm the engineering lead for this project. And my name's Sam. I'm also grade 12, uh, and I'm the coding lead for this project. Before we talk about our solution to automation, here are some examples of jobs that have already been tackled by other systems. You probably already use some kind of machine learning today. For example, Google Maps, which uses machine learning for navigation, or YouTube and Netflix, learning about your preferences to suggest the best media for you. Or even Facebook, recognizing your face to group photos of you together. Many social media services use artificial intelligence to optimize the user experience as well. Automation and machine learning is also heavily applied in autonomous cars like Tesla's. Slambot is our version of an autonomous vehicle. What it does is it can create a map of its surroundings and track where it is in space. We designed our platform to be as versatile and easy to adjust as possible, making the prototype stage as efficient as it could be. The goal for this project was to create a robot which we can give a destination and have it navigate its surroundings to this waypoint. This was designed to be a proof of concept for an automated delivery, as it could be used to deliver packages to specific destinations without the need for human intervention. Vehicular automation is one of the most versatile types of automation, as it can be applied to many situations. If you have a robot that can not only complete a task, but understand where it is and where it needs to go to complete said task, it opens up a whole range of possibilities for automation. This is why our platform is so flexible. The brain of our bot is a Raspberry Pi 4, which is a full desktop computer the size of a credit card. The main sensor on the top is a LiDAR, which stands for Light Detection and Ranging Sensor. The LiDAR uses a laser that spins 360 degrees and bounces off any nearby surfaces, back into the receiver of the LiDAR. The distance is then calculated by using the time it takes for the laser to bounce back. If you've ever seen a virtual house tour, this was created using the same technology. Slambot makes use of ROS, Robot Operating Systems, which uses a variety of libraries related to robotics and automation. So here's a short video of our robot functioning. So as you'll see in the video, it's running a preset path and mapping as it moves. Uh, I'll go a bit more into depth uh, about what code is running on the robot right now and how it works in the next slide. But as you can see, it's actually updating the map on the side there as it's moving.
So the coding aspect of this project involves many processes which have to work together. Most of these can be handled by the ROS, which we run on the Raspberry Pi. One of the most important algorithms is called SLAM, or Simultaneous Localization and Mapping, hence the name SLAMBOT. This algorithm converts LiDAR data into a map by identifying new and already scanned points. When these points are considered and the new and old ones are combined, the map can be created. This algorithm does have some limitations, but it can create accurate maps if these are considered. The reason why we need to use SLAM in conjunction with the LiDAR is because the LiDAR data is static. The LiDAR is almost like the robot's vision, and then the SLAM is like its memory. So as you can see here on the left, uh, as the LiDAR scans new points, the old ones are gone, and it just keeps the points that are already scanned. But once it's processed by the actual SLAM library, we can use those points to add them all together and create a map. Once this map is created, we can use the ROS that we talked about to generate route plans and identify where the robot is. This is the next step for our robot. The SLAM library we were running using prior to ROS was called Breezy SLAM by Simon Levy. This is a really great library since it's so simple, but it can be a bit unreliable. And as you saw in the video that we showed, that was running the Breezy SLAM. And it's not super accurate and can have a bit of artifacts and problems. But hopefully once we get uh, ROS running, then that will actually update that map a lot better. One of the most important aspects of this project is our prospects for real-world application. There are so many situations where the same technology could be used for an actual occupation if we scale up our robot, since it can map almost any indoor surroundings. It's very versatile. Our project is a proof of concept that can be applied, for example, to package delivery robots, autonomous indoor mapping, or even could be used for emergency scenarios where it's too dangerous for a person. For example, to survey a damaged building after an earthquake. Though our robot is on a smaller scale and may not have a wide range of features, many robots currently in production, such as these ones seen here from Boston Dynamics, use a very similar technology and concepts. Notice the LiDAR sensor on both of these. This project involves many convoluted elements which have to work together to form the final product. We believe we need to invest a lot more time into understanding these elements to continue to a final point, as we ran into several roadblocks which left us stuck. The first was the limitations of our original computer, the Raspberry Pi 3. It did not have enough processing power to run the SLAM software, and the maps that were generated were not usable. We needed to upgrade to a Raspberry Pi 4, which was much more powerful, to generate working maps and run the other processes. The most fundamental aspect of this project was coding. This provided possibly the greatest engineering challenge in our STEM careers, as we had to apply some incredibly con complex concepts, including machine learning, uh, algorithms, and operating systems. We eventually decided to try to use robot operating systems, which combined almost everything we need for the coding part of this project. Though this sounds convenient, it is an incredibly extensive topic and has a very steep learning curve. For this reason, we require much more time to be put into programming and learning about ROS to fully complete our robot. Switching to ROS also meant we had to scrap all the code that, and libraries that we were using beforehand. Though we didn't quite get every part of this project working, we learned a vast amount and gained many skills which we can apply to many other situations. Since this project combines so many different topics and aspects of engineering, we got to apply a lot of what we've learned from previous projects and learn a lot more about many concepts. Both of us are part of the first robotics team at our school, so this project was also a great way for us to apply what we've learned through the robotics club, especially with 3D modeling. We gained a lot of experience with Python and other coding languages, and got really in-depth to apply these algorithms and software needed to complete the project. Even though we did not reach our final goals, we gained a lot from working on something so advanced. Overall, this project has been a huge learning experience, and it was very engaging to work on something so complex. So this project has a great amount of potential, and only needs a bit more work to have a finished product, prototype. To achieve our goals, we will need to go very in-depth with ROS and learn more about coding in that environment. Once we've gotten comfortable with that, we will be able to use the maps that we generate with the SLAMBOT to identify its position and allow it to navigate to a desired destination. We have also come up with many stretch goals over the course of this project, including stair climbing, QR code recognition to identify package destinations, autonomous mapping so that we don't need to create a map manually, and many other features which will make this project truly autonomous.
So thank you very much for watching, everybody. Thank you, Wonder Twins, for sharing that with us. I'm glad you could take the time out of your evening to uh, come out tonight. It was our pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Now, uh, up next, uh, we have a short video presentation uh, from two girls, uh, two STEM9 girls uh, that might be better than me at math, uh, the STEM9 math magicians, uh, Mercedes and Isabel, and we will play the video now. I'm Isabel. I'm in the STEM9 cohort. Oh, uh, hi, I'm Mercedes, and I'm in STEM9. So a way that I got good at math was um, practice and working with other people, uh, discussing the problem and finding a solution. And you just gotta be open-minded and flexible. You, don't, you can't just be super stuck on one way of doing it. You gotta practice a bunch of different ways because sometimes it's easier to see a problem from a different angle. I think that group work is a good way to learn math because we're learning from each other and we can develop each other's skills and someone might see something that you might not and then you can learn from that. It was helpful to work in teams because when I wouldn't understand things, other people would understand things and I'd learn from them. And so after a while, I feel like I can solve a lot of problems now because of just background knowledge from a lot of things, such as like knowing things that I've learned from other people. Um, okay, so if you were to be in our class and see us working in groups, um, it'd probably look like people in different groups. Um, we don't all work in the same group. We split up and we'd be discussing over like a certain problem. And um, we'd obviously have noise because we need to be discussing stuff. And so there'd be a high volume in the room. And people, sometimes they go from one group to another group, just like to ask if people got the same answer because sometimes people can't agree on things and people are curious. When you learn new problems in a group, uh, you want to discuss a lot and take other people's views into account. If So people can sometimes explain it in a different way. So if you don't understand it the way someone else explains it, there's other people and they can help explain it in different ways. For instance, like with me and my friends, Sometimes I can't explain it to both of them, so I'll explain it to one of them, and then they can explain it to the other one, and then everyone understands. It's so useful to have other people's opinions and views on things, because sometimes you miss such simple things, and somebody else will see that, so. I think that pretty much sums it up. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, uh, a very intentional and a direct video. And of course, I'd like to thank uh, Isabel and Mercedes uh, for putting their effort into it. Um, now, I want to share with you all uh, a STEM 10, a STEM 10 STEMmer uh, trying to save the world uh, by learning all things STEM. Uh, Ambu, I'd like to uh, invite you to the screen. And um, once you're ready to go, you can take it away. Hi, Victor. Okay, Hi. I am going to be sharing my presentation with you. I'm excited to see it. Hold on. And, oops, sorry. And here we go. Okay. So my name is Ombu Anse, and I have been in the STEM program for three years. Now, some of you may know that the STEM stands for four different disciplines science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. But how do those fit together? Let's take a look at two examples of projects from this year. I'll briefly explain how each discipline fits into our aquaponics project and our passive house project. Now, the first project I wanna talk about is aquaponics. Aquaponics is a system for combining aquatic creatures and hydroponics, which is a method of growing plants without soil in a sustainable way. Our current agricultural practices need improvement and aquaponics is one way to do that. Now let's talk about the science of aquaponics. A key factor to understanding aquaponics is the nitrogen cycle. 
Fish need nitrogen as it is their protein and like us, they need it to survive. They intake the nitrogen by eating their food and then excrete it via their waste in the form of ammonia. This ammonia makes the water acidic and if it builds up, it can be deadly to the fish. Now you can see the problem here. The solution to this is plants as they're able to essentially filter the water. They absorb the nitrogen, but they can't absorb it in the form of ammonia. So as part of a three-step process, different bacteria convert the ammonia into nitrites and then into nitrates. And once it's in the form of nitrates, the plants can use it as their fertilizer, leaving the water fresh and clean and the fish safe. Now, another issue addressed in aquaponic system is pH levels. We need to know chemistry in order to solve this. Fish thrive in a certain pH level that isn't too acidic from the ammonia, like I mentioned earlier. Now we realized that we would have to be monitoring and adjusting the pH levels constantly. Now who would want to do that every single day? We asked ourselves, is it possible to automate this process? Here's where we went to technology for a solution. We designed and made a pH monitoring device. This involved programming and wiring the pH monitor, as well as recording the data. Now, where did math come up in this project? We did a lot of mathematical modeling in the design of our system. What size pump and heater do we need? What rate should we feed the fish? How do we right size the number of plants to filter the water? This math was integral for our project to function. Now that's how our aquaponics system fits together and how each subject is crucial to the whole project. The disciplines all have their own part in creating the system. As Aristotle said, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. What I've learned in the past three years is that in real world applications, these disciplines are always going to be interconnected. In fact, it's really only in theory when you can attempt to isolate them from each other. Connecting these topics is logical and effective. Okay, let's look at another example. Climate change is real and it's a huge issue. How can we as individuals make the difference? We need to do a better job of heating and insulating our homes. The truth is, Vancouver's standard of house insulation is very low, and most people use gas to heat their homes. Can we design homes that leak less heat, as well as use solar power to offset gas? Now, where's the science in this project? Thermodynamics is the branch of science relating to heat. There are three different kinds of heat transfer, conduction, convection, and radiation. We used these theories to model and design our main experiment. Now for our actual experiment, we constructed two model homes out of rigid insulation to demonstrate the difference between high and low values of insulation, similar to a passive house and a Vancouver special, which is what we named them. Now, how can we use technology to run our experiment? We had heaters in both the houses, but how do we build a thermostat? How do we monitor the energy use of both homes? We used an array of eight solar panels to power the houses. How do we control the flow of energy? This gave us a chance how to wire the solar panels, how to properly construct the houses, as well as how to program temperature sensors and heaters. Now, did we need math for any of this? Throughout the project, we're always doing calculations and estimates. For example, can we predict how much heat these houses will lose and how many solar panels are required to keep up with that loss? Statistically, how much solar radiation can we expect in Vancouver and how many batteries will it take to store it for when we need it? We used the heat loss equation to calculate the heat loss and determined that we would need an array of eight solar panels and two deep cycle batteries. Now, these are just two examples of many, many projects we've done throughout the years in STEM. This format allows us to learn the skills, but most importantly, apply them. I'm aware how applying skills, troubleshooting, and project management are all abilities that I got in STEM, but I now use in my everyday life, not just in school. And for me, honestly, these projects are such a fun and exciting way to combine these disciplines and learn so many new things. It's really amazing to see how at the end of every project, everything fits together so nicely and every element is crucial to the project. 
I'm really happy that I chose to join STEM uh, in grade eight. I know this probably sounds like an advertisement for STEM, but honestly, this is really the perfect fit for me. I enjoy coming to school and I'm never bored and always up to something new and interesting. I'd like to quickly finish with a quote from the early French mathematician Henri Poincaré, which I think applies to this. Science is built up of facts as a house is built of stones, but an accumulation of facts is no more a science than a heap of stones as a house. STEM combines these four disciplines because they work better together. I'd like to thank everyone for coming out and watching our presentations. It really means a lot to us. Uh, I hope everyone is doing well and safe. Thank you. Thank you, Ambu. And uh, I do feel a lot more educated now that you, you've shared that with us. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad that you're uh, so passionate about the program. Uh, the outlook looks good. And uh, thank you for your hard work. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And now uh, it is video time again, uh, but I'd like to uh, say hello to our former STEM 12 graduates who are out there watching. Um, we're all missing you. And I hope that uh, you guys are finding uh, success in your studies. Uh, but now, uh, again, like I said before, it is video time once again. Uh, Max, uh, he's in STEM 10. His video will be about his capstone submarine. Uh, he's passionately trying to study and reach the ocean floor. Hey, I'm Maxwell. I'm in grade 10, and throughout this school year, I've been making myself an RC submarine. Ever since I was little, I've always been into RC vehicles, but I've never actually had an RC submarine before. Over the years, I've accumulated a ridiculous amount of spare parts and RC equipment, and I kind of want to use it all up. I've been doing that during capstone projects in the STEM program, and through three years, I've made two planes and now one submarine. We do capstone projects in STEM at the end of each year, so you can use all of the knowledge you've gained that year to make a really good project of your own. This year was actually an exception, and we worked on the capstones periodically throughout the year. I'm glad, though, because it gave us more time and I could choose a more ambitious project. The submarine is made out of two sewage pipes with a T connector, which makes it look a little bit like an H. One half is dedicated to the motors and electronics, and the other half is dedicated to the ballast system. A linear actuator moves pistons, which fills the bottom half of the submarine with water, which can make it sink, and then it can push the water back out, which makes it lighter and float again. One of the challenges that comes with building an RC submarine is that RC signals and Wi-Fi both don't really go through water very well. If I was trying to use a wireless connection, when I dive below the surface, like I am right now, usually I'd lose complete control and I wouldn't be able to talk to the submarine anymore. To work around this, the entire submarine is on a tether and through that tether there's a wired connection to the RC equipment and a wired connection to the GoPro broadcasting a live stream. I think the final test was very successful and I had full control and a live stream at a depth of 4 meters, which is equivalent to the depth of the deep end of Templeton Pool. Originally, the tests were supposed to be at Templeton Pool where you can see through the water, except due to COVID-19 I had to go to Kate's Park instead because all of the pools closed. I think the great thing about capstone projects in general is that you can learn everything about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math in a project that you choose and you're really invested in and it makes school just a lot more enjoyable when you're doing something that you really want to do. I had tons of fun working on this project throughout the year, and I'm really happy with the finished product. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, thank you, Max, uh, for taking the time to make that video. Uh, we've, you've, you've, uh, you've worked hard on your project, and I think it really did show uh, in the video. Uh, I'm happy that you're so passionate about uh, your RC submarine, and I do hope that you continue to uh, pursue your passion. And now last, uh, but definitely not least, uh, we have our last uh, live presenter, uh, Tyler Wallace. Uh, he's uh, STEM's very own giraffe uh, coming in at an astonishing uh, six foot five. Uh, he'll be talking about uh, the SAP internship that he took uh, the previous summer, uh, the lessons learned and the lessons to learn. Tyler, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Victor. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Take it away. All right. Thank you. I'm going to start up my presentation now. Okay. So that's right. I'm going to be talking about 21st century skills today. Hi everybody, my name is Tyler Takeshi Wallace and I am a grade 12 STEM student. I've been in the STEM program for five years now and next year I'll be going into general sciences with hopes of transferring into environmental sciences in the future. I've been in the STEM program for five years now and last year I got the incredible opportunity to be one of the two first ever high school aged interns to work at SAP. Now for those of you who don't know, SAP is a software development company that specializes in uh, business management software and enterprise resource planning software. Uh, SAP is also the beloved sponsor of the STEM program here at Templeton. 
and for years they've been providing us with meaningful support and funding alongside their mentorship program, which brings SAP mentors into STEM classes to teach students all about 21st century skills, which is what I'm going to be doing here today as well. But before I go into that, I want to talk a little bit about my internship and the work I did last summer. As I mentioned before, I was one of the two high school students that summer, the other being Danielle Pebres, who is another STEM student from Templeton. And this was actually the first time that any high school aged uh, student had been put to go work as an intern at SAP. And it was uh, really special to be a part of and only possible because of the relationship that is held between SAP and STEM. Uh, the two of us were stationed at the SAP office, which is in, Van in Vancouver, down in Yale Town. And in that office, we were put on our own team called the Cloud Engineering Platform. Uh, the team lead of that Cloud Engineering Platform acted as a mentor for us, really helped us guide us through the internship, helped us work on our project, and really just gave us a great taste of what a working office environment was like, which was obviously something that neither of us had ever experienced at 16 years old. On top of that, we also worked very closely with SAP IXP, or their Internship Experience Project, which is a mentorship program that brings a bunch of different interns from a bunch of different SAP offices around, Vancouver, around North America and into these weekly phone calls with SAP mentors to teach us all about 21st century skills and how to apply them in the real world. Not only was this an amazing chance for us to learn from these mentors that SAP provided, but as the youngest interns as high school students, we also got to talk to the other interns who were in college or university. And they actually had a lot of words of wisdom and advice for us because they were in similar boats as us. They were trying to figure out what they wanted and how to get there. Overall, it was a great learning experience. On top of that, we also worked on a project at the SAP Vancouver office called the Employee Engagement Project, which was basically uh, our job was to develop a system that would measure the effectiveness of events that were held at SAP Vancouver. It was a lot of uh, work related to survey building with integrated artificial intelligence, alongside some spreadsheet work and data analysis. And overall, it was a really fun and unique experience. So I've thrown around the term 21st century skill a couple times, but I think it's about time I go into depth about what it really means. By definition, a 21st century skill, also known as a soft skill, is a skill or a core competency that is believed to be required to thrive in the working world of today. There's a lot of these 21st century skills out there. The most four common known, commonly known as the four C's, communication, collaboration, creativity, and critical thinking. Um, there's also other ones like being able to plan ahead for things or organize yourself and so many more. And I personally think that these soft skills are more important than what are known as hard skills or skills that are related to your field of work, whether that's business or computer science or physics or whatever it may be. And I'm gonna use myself as an example as to why I think that. I've been in the STEM program for five years. And as many of you know by now, the STEM program is a project-based learning program which brings students into groups to work on problems and projects related to the four STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math. But what not everybody realizes is that while these students are working on these projects together in groups to solve problems, they also develop a lot of these soft skills like collaboration, critical thinking, communication, and so much more. And that's really what I realized when I was asked to go work at SAP for a summer because I knew I didn't have any of the hard skills that I would need to work at SAP, like experience with data analysis or spreadsheet build thing or survey building, because I was 16 years old and I had never done any of that before. Um, but I did know that I was gonna have to apply the skills that I had learned from STEM into my work at SAP. And it actually ended up being a lot, making this transition from student to intern a lot smoother. At the beginning of the internship, I was actually very surprised to find that SAP wasn't just an office building with three floors and hundreds of cubicles with people typing away at each desk. Of course, there was a little bit of that because it was a software development company, but I was actually also very surprised to find that there were probably near a hundred different workplaces or meeting rooms that were all varying in size and materials, like some had whiteboards or smart boards and some rooms even had walls that you could write on. It was a lot of fun to work with and these rooms were actually specifically made so that employees could come together into groups to work on problems 
work on projects and plan things out with the, together. And that might sound very familiar because that's exactly what STEM is for and what it trains their students to do. So during the beginning planning phases of my project at the office, I actually got to apply a lot of the soft skills I had learned from STEM, like collaboration, communication, problem solving, organization, and so much more into my work at SAP, which was great. And of course, I did learn, learn those hard skills that I mentioned before at SAP, but I also built up and improved on those soft skills. And I think that's really valuable because now I know that these skills are transferable. So the learnings that I've gotten from STEM and from SAP are going to be applicable to, you know, to whatever I end up doing in the future, whether that's as a student in a learning, in a learning environment or as an employee at, in a working environment. So to conclude, I really want to just say that I believe these 21st century skills are definitely needed and necessary to work in the world of today. And for me personally, the mentorships that I received from STEM and from SAP really helped show me what I needed to know to do well in the working world of today. And I think that's really valuable. I also think it's a pretty good representation of the STEM motto, just to fail fast and fail forward. Because I'm not a perfect straight A student, and I never was, but I'm a hard worker and I'm willing to get outside of my comfort zone. I'm someone who's ready to fall down and get back up again to learn something new. And I really think that's what the STEM program is all about, being able to make mistakes and recognizing that, and then reflecting on those mistakes to learn something new. When you apply those learnings into any situation you're thrown into next, you actually, and repeating that cycle a lot, you actually end up uh, learning a lot of these 21st century skills, these skills that are applicable in any situation, which I think is really valuable. So to answer the question that is asked many, many times in high schools all over the world, when am I ever gonna use this skill? To be honest, I've found myself asking this question a couple times throughout my high school career, but never while I was in STEM, because I know that these skills are transferable. So it doesn't matter if I go into a STEM field or not, because honestly, I don't know where I'm gonna be in five, 10, 15 years from now, but it doesn't really matter because the mentorships that I received from STEM and SAP really gave me the skills that I needed to, you know, needed to know to go anywhere I want. The skills, these skills are more important to students now than ever before. They not only set students up for successful learning, but they set students up to work in a world that is constantly changing and needs constant learning as well. Believe it or not, we live in the 21st century and it's different than the last one. The world of today is constantly changing with new technologies, sciences, trades, industries, and everything in between being developed and redeveloped every year. It only makes sense to prepare students to deal with that change and how to adapt with, to it and how to learn from it. In life, we're not always given control of the steering wheel. Take this curveball that we've been thrown here in 2020. Nobody could have seen this pandemic coming, but as a society, we've come together and adapted and learned something new from each other to survive. These are the skills that we're not only gonna to need today, but they're the skills that we're gonna need when everything, when everything is different tomorrow and for the rest of our lives. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler, uh, for that amazing presentation. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, we do have to send you back to the zoo now. Uh, the zoo uh, will be there shortly. <laughs> um, gotcha. I'm just kidding. But uh, of course, uh, thanks for your hard work and dedication uh, that helped to make this possible. And uh, I'm happy that you took away so many valuable skills last summer. Great. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, wow. Um, what a fun uh, educational and uh, a new uh, night. Uh, the time is now uh, 742. Uh, on behalf of the STEM team, I would like to thank everybody uh, for tuning in to our annual uh, but modified uh, temp talks. Of course, uh, we would like to say a massive thank you uh, to SAP, uh, its mentors, uh, its support, and uh, more specifically, uh, we'd like to say thank you to uh, Jen, Monica, Keith, and uh, Wing for being our temp talks uh, guinea pigs. Um, and of course, we'd also like to thank the VSB and Templeton's administration staff uh, for providing support to the STEM program, uh, allowing the program to function and giving students an amazing uh, education. Now, uh, of course, I'd be remiss uh, not to say thank you uh, to Hengeveld 
uh, and Gen Z uh, for always being there uh, for students whenever they need it. Uh, their unwavering, uh, really perseverance uh, to give us an education uh, that reflects what is needed in today's uh, workplace uh, is a representation of the, the bestest of the best people. And, um, and with that said, uh, I cordially would like to uh, invite you all to our modified gallery walk um, where all of our students have uh, curated a video of their favorite learning experiences. And uh, we will uh, give you all the link to that now. I believe they should be in the chats of your streaming platforms. Um, so feel free to click off once we finish talking. Uh, again, uh, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, but before we sign off for good, uh, I'd like to invite all the presenters uh, back to the main stage and we will all say our final goodbyes. Uh, this is uh, the full team. Uh, minus Luca, he's also in the background streaming to Twitch. And again, uh, thank you all for tuning in tonight. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. And uh, of course, a COVID-free summer. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Good night.